If you've heard anything about the auto industry in Canada over the last 20 plus years, you've probably heard it from our next guest, Jim Stanford, longtime economist at the Canadian Auto Workers Union, now Unifor. He's about to decamp from the Great White North and move to Australia. And so we welcome Jim Stanford back to TVO for a look back and a look ahead. And it's great to see you here again. Great honor to be here, Steve. Thank Although, you. So why are you moving to Australia? I have to know. Well, have you looked at the weather outside here lately? <laughs> Besides <laughs> no, I, that? It isn't for the weather. It's a, a family move, Steve, actually. Uh, my partner is uh, an academic, and uh, she's uh, landed a, a tremendous job as chair of uh, social work at the University of Sydney, uh, which is a great university. It's one of those jobs you can't say no to, and uh, so we you know, met as a family and decided uh, we'll take our two kids down there and we'll, we'll try and adventure from the other side of the planet for a few years. And you got anything lined up for yourself? Not, not formally that I can announce yet. I've got a couple irons in the fire. I'm, I'm sure I'll be uh, active in the policy research field in Australia, but I'm also going to keep my foot in the Canadian debates from down there. Uh, it's a curious move in some respects for you because last I checked, there's not much of an Australian auto industry, is there? <laughs> and there's going to be zero uh, as of next year. In like fact, getting the, out entirely, the industry they? is closing down in yeah. Australia, which in a way is a, a parable, if you like, uh, for Canada. That, you know, and they have similar history or similar reasons behind it. They're a resource intensive economy where we have bitumen and natural gas. They have iron ore and coal. And when the commodity price bubble was inflating, everybody seemed like the, the streets were paved with gold and, and that would be their future. And they let the auto industry go. They, they had a high dollar, a high Australian dollar. They were considered uncompetitive compared to lower cost jurisdictions. So they kind of threw up their hands and said, okay, the industry is gonna shut down. So Ford, General Motors and Toyota are all closing their plants within the next year and there'll be no industry left. But now, Iron ore prices have fallen. Coal has been even worse hit than oil has. So they're in a real bind now because it turns out commodities are not uh, the wave of the future. I'm presuming you think that is not a template for Ontario to follow. I, I think the, the warning lesson is you got to have some diversification. Yeah, the resource industries uh, are important. Uh, they can generate good jobs, good value, but uh, we got to keep our, our, our finger in all, all aspects uh, of the economic value chain, including manufacturing. I'd say that's a lesson for us. So let's do a little looking back here. Over your 20 plus years yes. with uh, first the CAW, now Unifor, which we should say in full disclosure represents some of the guys who are taking your right picture on. right yeah. now and the people in the control room. Uh, how do you see the Ontario economy changing most significantly over those two decades? Uh, well, it's been a roller coaster, of course. You know, when I started with the union in the mid 90s, it was a great time for the auto industry, for manufacturing in general. Um, you had a lot of investment coming in. Uh, you had strong auto sales. Uh, you had new, new auto plants being created. I mean, that seems like a distant memory, but we were actually growing the footprint of the industry here. Uh, then you had a number of things happen, and it, it does come back to this resource question that, that we were just discussing. Around the turn of the century is when everybody went nuts over China and the super cycle, they called it, and they always had these great economic theories to explain why the price of oil would only go up and never down. Um, and uh, we kind of got caught in the crosswinds of that in Ontario. We definitely suffered because of the rising dollar. I also think that we suffered because of the shifting in attention. You know, um, uh, politically and, and in policy circles, there was so much infatuation with resources and Canada being an energy superpower and so on. I think we forgot the importance of ongoing attention in, in manufacturing. So. We've seen obviously a retrenchment, a terrible downturn, uh, probably lost 350,000 jobs in manufacturing in Ontario. Uh, on the other hand, we are still here and some of our plants are, are the most productive, highest quality plants in, in auto, in aerospace, in machinery, in, even in electronics. So I do think that, that we have got the basis for a recovery. And uh, if there's you know, a silver lining to what's happened, uh, it is that, that what we're left with is absolute world class and uh, with the right attention and the right you know, ingredients, I think that Ontario will remain a manufacturing superpower. Would you acknowledge, though, that the, uh, initially the Harper government and the McGuinty governments, and, but basically the governments of Canada and Ontario in general, have been very committed to the auto industry over the last many decades. Is that fair to say? Uh, absolutely, but I would say in a kind of an ad hoc, sort of crisis-driven way, you know, so that when we faced a, a terrible situation, like the uh, restructurings that happened in 2009 with the global financial crisis, there you had the Harper government, of all people, lining up to give billions of dollars in, in emergency aid uh, to those companies. I think more out of necessity than out of their, that, that they thought it was really their, their core values to do that kind of thing, uh, but they did. 
uh, and the same goes for other interventions federally and provincially. I think what we've lacked in Canada and that other countries that have been more successful consistently, like Germany or Korea, mm -hmm. even Mexico, is a sort of integrated, focused, consistent auto strategy. You know, we've had kind of piecemeal measure here and there when it was necessary, but we weren't always lining up our ducks. Uh, some of the things that we would do would be at odds with what we were trying to help the auto industry mm -hmm. with. So uh, I do think we still have to, to integrate and align our auto-related policies so that they're consistent and more effective than they have been. Almost every time, probably actually every time you've been on this program in the past, mm. it's to discuss some very big debate or big issue that's happening at that moment. Yes. And I don't want to do that this time. Okay. I'd actually like to take just sort of a big step back and find out more about why you are mm. the way you are. Oh, gosh. For example, your own thinking on uh, approaches to uh, economic development and the economy mm -hmm. and, you know, why you are kind of a, uh, an economist who works for a union as opposed to the guy who right. works for the Conference Board of Canada or the yeah. C.D. Howe Institute. Hmm. Why are you that way? Hmm. I, I'm, I'm not too reluctant to call myself a left-wing economist. <laughs> uh, some people would consider that a contradiction in terms, I suppose, but um, I actually went into economics from a, a, an interest and a passion about uh, social justice. My first economics degree was at the University of Calgary. Um, I studied economics there, believe it or not, with one Stephen Harper. Uh, we were going through classes it at the same take, time. It didn't take, Jim. It didn't take. Whatever, whatever you were Since discussing then, we, with we him. we went different paths. Yeah. Um, but I already had, uh, I guess, uh, an interest in issues like inequality in the environment and... Uh, but you've chosen uh, full employment. You've chosen a. I mean, they. In fairness, I think Harper has interest in unemployment sure. and the economy oh, yeah. as well. From but his perspective, you right. approach it from totally yes. different ways. Was something yeah. in your background that, that led you to uh, being the way you are? I, I'm not sure. Perhaps a bit. I probably got a bit of these values, these kind of uh, social values, you know, from my family and my upbringing. But uh, you know, just I guess who I was. So at the time, I did the typical first year thing. I took all kinds of courses: mm -hmm. philosophy, sociology, political science, economics. And at the end of that year, I decided economics was a subject where you could concrete make most difference to building uh, a more inclusive, fair, uh, sustainable society. I, mm. I, I was actually quite deliberate and I've never regretted uh, that decision. I had some great professors at, at the University of Calgary who may not have agreed with me totally but encouraged me to think critically and to look at different perspectives in economics and, and, and that set me in my way. I'm guessing Milton Friedman was sort of not your guru, <laughs> right? Who, who, were, who, were the, who were the gurus that you looked up to? Hmm. A uh, very influential book at my undergraduate level was a book by Robert Heilbronner, uh, who was an American economist. He was based at a, a place in, in the U.S. called the New School for Social Research, which is where I ended up doing my Ph.D., hmm. uh, curiously enough. Uh, he presented the introduction to economics not as a matter of supply and demand and teaching it like, like you would teach physics, you know, with charts and graphs and so on. He presented it as a, a, a social issue, a historical issue. We talked about the controversies in economics and the battles between different schools of thought. And that approach to it, to saying that economics is a contested uh, subject, it's not a matter of math, you know, it's a matter of interests, often conflicting interests, mm. and whose interests are going to be respected most, infused my uh, approach. Then, as I went to graduate school in, in New York and also at, at Cambridge, where I did my master's, I was blessed by professors who had a kind of similar critical approach to, to teaching the subject mm. matter. As you look back on two decades of economic analysis and forecasting, I guess to some uh, respect as well, can you recall an incident where you, where you look at it now with the benefit of hindsight and say, I really got that one wrong? Oh, geez, I thought you were going to ask me, where, well, the ones I got right. <laughs> That's too easy. <laughs> What's the one where you said, boy, uh, I just blew that one? Um, wow, okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you this. We've been debating free trade agreements uh, in a big way for that entire period. And I, I think that our position about being critical about the nature of free trade agreements and the sort of the pigeonhole they were putting us in as a country, as a resource supplier, is still valid. But I will say that I underestimated, particularly in the Canada-US case, the extent to which the trade agreements would allow some of our high-tech, high-value exporters to get some good market share uh, in, in the US. So some of our high-value industries clearly did benefit from free trade with the U.S. anyways. Whether that, uh, whether that uh, can be replicated with other countries that we're talking about today, you know, like, like uh, Japan, say, in the TPP is another question, but... Um, can I just yeah. say, I, I give you a lot of credit for saying that because that's, that's something that has become religion in this country, and particularly those on the left cannot and will not say anything nice about free trade. 
At least I find that in the past. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm still, I want to caution uh, that I'm not endorsing it, but I am saying that I think that there are, uh, the, the debate horrible. is more subtle. The debate is more subtle, you uh, if you like. And even with the TPP, I'll acknowledge there could be some gains to certain industries in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can't go into it from a religious perspective, whether you're for it or against it. And, and I think the, the proponents of these deals are, are as guilty of that as we are. They have a model, an economic model, in which free trade always benefits everyone. And that's just clearly not, not the case. So I think we could be more, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, critical and uh, nuanced in our analysis of these things. After seeing it all over these years, mm -hmm. are you still a proponent of essentially, this is way too simplistic, but you know what I'm getting at here, you know, a, a big role for big government to play a, you know, an important part in uh, driving the economy and improving people's lives? Well, um, Steve, um, the, there's a saying in uh, sex therapy, <laughs> it's not how big it is, it's what you do with it, okay? <laughs> and believe it I or never not, thought I'd hear that analysis out of you, but okay. There's an analogy to that in terms of thinking about the role of government, mm -hmm. okay? It isn't really a question of do you have big government or small government. Uh, it's a question of what role is government playing in the economy and whose interests are being advanced by it. So I do believe that government will have to play and uh, uh, and needs to play a larger role, but not just larger for the sake of being larger. In the U.S., government is big. There's no doubt about it that government is big and intrusive and powerful. So it's, it's a question of why their society looks so different from ours is the sorts of things government does in, in whose interest. So I certainly do believe that we need more uh, uh, interventionist approaches to, to some kinds of regulation, economic development uh, in key industries, income redistribution, uh, and those kinds of things. So. Does the indebtedness of places like Spain and Italy and Greece and, dare I say, the province of Ontario, which is the biggest indebted subnational jurisdiction in the world, does that give you pause? Oh, certainly. Um, I don't think that those debts were caused by big government, per se, um, and you can find lots of jurisdictions in the world that have large governments or generous social programs. Uh, that don't have those debts. I think in the case of Greece and Spain, it was more a question of the economic crisis that undermined the country's ability to pay their bills. Um, so I would say the solution there is putting people back uh, to work. But um, we have to have a vision of a sustainable fiscal future. That doesn't necessarily mean balanced budgets uh, every year or, uh, or, or even ever, but it does mean your debt load has to be maintained at a, at a, a reasonable and sustainable level. What's the sweet level. number for, for Ontario, for example? Uh, economists have been debating that sweet number for ages. You know, in Europe, they thought they had the number. They actually set a rule in their European constitution. It shall not go higher than 60% of GDP. But oh, it kind it of blew that ridiculous. out of the water, Exactly. So uh, you have to look at the times, uh, interest rates, and because uh, uh, that determines how expensive the debt is going to be. And what's going for you in the economy? You know, if you've got very vibrant business investment or very strong exports, then you don't need... Uh, so much stimulus from government investments uh, in order to keep people working. Uh, if those things aren't there, and they haven't been there lately uh, in Canada and, and much of the rest of the industrialized world, then you're going to need a more uh, leadership role for government, you know, not just in kind of patching some band-aids, but actually leading the process of investment and economic growth on an ongoing basis. Let me ask you about unionization. Uh, this is not a very unionized country anymore, certainly not no. in the private sector, mm -hmm. much more so obviously in the public sector, but yes. hardly at all in the private sector. What if you were able to wave a magic wand and suddenly every workplace in the country tomorrow was unionized? How different would this country be? Would this be a better country? Um, well, I don't think you should do it by waving a magic wand. Like the, the, the relevance and power of a union comes from the willingness of people to be uh, part of something collective. You know, the whole idea of a union is that your bargaining position with your employer and your security in your workplace is better, you know, if you're doing it kind of arm in arm with the other workers in your, in your enterprise. So having something imposed by fiat is probably not going to work. If we could both, um, uh, I think, enhance the, the appreciation of the benefits of unionization among workers, and then even more important, give them a fair chance to form a union when they want one. And that's the problem we face in Canada. The labor laws are so tilted, the hoops you have to jump through to try and get a union, even if you and your mates in the workplace want one, um, is what's really inhibiting uh, unionization. So I think a fairer approach to that would allow unions to restore their power uh, in the labor market, and we would absolutely uh, be better off. The economic evidence that unions uh, improve economic equality, not just for union members either, but even for people who are never in a union, their wages get lifted 
by unionization. Um, the impacts on productivity and uh, lifelong learning in the workplace, very, very uh, positive. How about on the flexibility or dynamism that is required, particularly in a lot of the newer industries right. in, the, in the province or country? How would unionization affect them? Right. Uh, flexibility is important, although it, it is in the eye of the beholder. You know, oftentimes when people are saying you're being inflexible, what they actually mean is you're not letting me take the wallet out of your back pocket, right? You know, that's the kind of inflexibility that, that we should all hang on to. Uh, on the other hand, we do have to be open to new technologies, new forms of work organization, new ways of doing things, and, um, and unions, uh, I think, can be part of the problem or part of the solution uh, in that regard. In the auto industry in Canada, we're very proud of the fact that we've embraced uh, things like uh, world-class manufacturing, this new system that uh, Chrysler uses in its plants, and new technology. Uh, we want to manage how those types of things are implemented in the plants so that our members aren't adversely affected by them, but if they improve the efficiency of the plant, then they're going to enhance the chances that that plant's going to stay open, uh, which is why our union's been uh, very proactive on those things. Let's come full circle now and finish off uh, again on, uh, on your experience uh, in Australia. How, do you have any idea how long you're intending to stay? Uh, I would call it uh, a foreign posting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, it's, uh, it, you know, it'll be a few years, but I don't think it will be uh, forever. And uh, I'm very committed to, uh, uh, to Canada and the Canadian policy debates that I've been a part of. And, and I are look you on leave from Unifor? No, I'm, I'm You're finished. leaving. I'm finished my job. I cleaned out my office so over the Christmas holidays. That was a, that was a challenge. Mm. Uh, and uh, I will stay on in an advisory capacity with the union's uh, leadership, including in the run-up to the uh, big auto talks that we'll be having this fall. So I will still be part of the Unifor family, but, but my you'll need position, a new job when you come back. Exactly. My position as economist there is, uh, is done. <laughs> They've got a great team of other younger researchers, including uh, economists uh, on staff, that will be doing the same work that I did. Any secrets you now want to share with us or bridges you want to burn, given that you're going to be leaving the country? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, well, you know, we've had uh, some, some tremendous uh, excitement, some drama, some huge debates, some huge controversies uh, in the time that I've been at the Union. Um, and a lot of them went on behind closed doors. You know, there's probably books to be written. There's clearly a book to be written about the 09 restructuring of the auto companies and what went on there and the role of the companies mm -hmm. and the incredible role of the, uh, some of the government people in making that happen. Um, on the whole, it's, it's been an enormous privilege for me. Like, I had a choice when I finished my PhD whether to go into kind of a formal academic type of a role, and, and I ended up working for the union, and uh, it's been actually incredibly gratifying. I've never regretted that decision because you do have the chance to try and impact what's happening in, in the real world, not just in the realm of ideas, but in what you actually negotiate and implement and, and can achieve, and uh, I've been very blessed in that way. Jim, we're... Uh I don't want to say blessed, but we're very happy, huh. anyway, that you always take our phone calls and visit us at this uh, studio when we have asked in the past. And we wish you all the luck in the world in Australia. Oh. And as they say, don't be a stranger. Uh, Skype works. And, I've uh, got Skype, Steve, and, so we'll, and we'll you'll be, be back here, uh, I'm sure, from time to right time, on. and we'll see you again. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Jim Stanford, formerly of Unifor. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.